my question for tonight that I'd like to pose to all of us as we begin um, is uh, our election uh, is a week away. Um, and I was going to ask you all how you were going to vote, but then I thought maybe that wouldn't be the thing to start with. Um, but I think it's uh, something that maybe all of us are thinking. Um, it seems to be getting uh, more and more conversation. It's just that our, our conversations with each other when it, uh, in these kind of uh, civic matters becomes more contentious, more divisive. Um, and I'm wondering where you see uh, hope for that? Where do you see uh, maybe a return to being able to have an exchange of ideas where we have different ideas, um, where it doesn't uh, mean that you need to demean someone or belittle someone because they think differently, but you can have respect for each other um, and figure out how to make decisions as a community or as a country together. So, um, that is uh, that is quite broad. Um, so maybe that'll give you something uh, to think of. But I'm looking for uh, hope for us as uh, as a culture, as a community. Um, mine mine is this. <clears throat> I will start just to give you all time to think uh, as well. But um, when I was growing up, I just returned from my uh, farm that I grew up in, in Minnesota. And after uh, our church service on Sundays, my dad and my aunt, who was a county commissioner, my dad was the chairman of our local school board, and my great aunt was a state representative, they would all skip Sunday school. And I'm outing them publicly now so they can all hear about it. Um, and they would go across the dirt road to our farm and they would have these conversations around the table with coffee and some bars. Uh, you know, they're called bars in Minnesota, some sort of treat. Um, but they would have, and they came from different political persuasions, but they would have all these kind of uh, discussions back and forth um, and to my knowledge, they didn't leave with their feelings hurt at the end of it. They would disagree, uh, but they would talk through things. And as a young boy, I was fascinated with listening to them. Um, but I asked them when I was home, you know, am I remembering that correctly? Like you guys would have these conversations every Sunday, um, but you wouldn't leave, you know, feeling like you had been uh, not listened to or uh, demeaned in any way or disrespected in any way. And so they, they said yes, but that's what I want us to return to uh, rather than uh, all of us being in one of two camps and um, lobbying things and not understanding each other. So uh, there's, there's my hope for our, for our next week and for our next uh, year uh, as our, as uh, as we move into this election, anybody else want to jump in on that one? I, I'll go next. Oh, you first, Walt. Well, uh, I have thirty two years in the Navy, so it's probably not too hard to guess how I'm likely to vote. But I'm also sort of a uh, fatalist on 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 the bright side. I remember that we got through four years of Jimmy Carter and the country was still alive and well. So there I is. think there is, is hope I, no I, matter what happens. For me, I, I think my hope comes, I have three millennial children and they're adults now, all of them. And um, I watch them and they don't find this acceptable. And as a baby boomer, we were supposed to make the world change, and we did, sometimes not for the better. <clears throat> I'm more than happy to pass the baton over to this next generation coming behind because I think they have their heads on straight. So that's my hope. God bless you. I hope it is, too. Phil. I think that, you know, the big thing in terms of respect for, you know, the other side or, or expecting respect is that if, if – I think if I feel that the other side is coming at it from 
the standpoint that they genuinely are wanting this country to get better and to be better. I may disagree with their end result. I may disagree with their methodology, but I think I can respect that they're coming at it from the position of, I want this country to be better in the long term for the next generation and generation after that, you know, on whatever level, environmental, commercial, you know, military, you know, whatever it is, if they're looking at that, I may, di again, disagree with it. If I think that they're coming at it from the standpoint of what's in it for me, how, how can it be for me or from a disingenuous standpoint of, um, you know, I just want to win the argument. I don't actually care what you're saying. You know, I'm just there to argue. Then, I, you know, it's like I, I've, I've gotten past the point like I was in college where, you know, I love to argue and debate for the sake of debating. I mean, I'm a lawyer. I do that every day. I don't need to do it for fun. But if it's a matter of let's exchange ideas for a constructive purpose to share ideas, broaden each other's horizons and go from there, I think I'm much more inclined to do that rather than I'm right and you're wrong. And this is why, you know, and, you know, my way or the highway. As long as I guess bottom line is as long as I know that the other side's willing to listen to me and isn't going to just be, sl you know, slinging bombs the whole way, then I'm, I'm going to be more inclined to do that. Thank you, Phil. John. Yeah, Darren, I think uh, my answer to this is uh, pretty straightforward. And I think I don't think it's changed any in, in this cycle as it has in the past is um, let's get involved locally and, and build a community that uh, that each of us locally wants to live in. Um, I think the uh, uh, quote actually outside my window right now is, uh, let's let, uh, build yourself a life that you can't wait to wake up to. Um, and so I like to use things like that uh, on a daily basis. So um, I, I like to do that in this community that I serve, uh, work in, live in, play in. And all this country is, is a community of communities. Um, while I will respect that what works in one community may not work in another, um, as long as there are still people locally trying to improve it, uh, that's what I'm going to work for. And in order to break down some of the issues that we see today, um, I'll invite anybody I know to help make this place uh, better one day at a time. So if we disagree on how to do that, uh, let's go do something together and figure out how it works or doesn't, and we'll learn from it and implement it into the future. So that's how I ended up right here today. Thank you very much. Pat Hatchell. Oh, I'm the last one. So I deal with a lot of people every day from all walks of life. And I'll tell you, I don't think there's a split what people think there are. I think sometimes the media makes it out to be much worse than it is. I deal with people from the left and the right and everywhere in between. You know what? The vast majority of these people get along really well. They really do. And you watch the news or whatever, and you think everyone's out there hating each other from every different race, religion, whatever. And that's just not true. So I have a lot of hope because almost all the people I see are actually nice, decent people that can talk intelligently. They want what's best for everybody. Both sides do. And they get along and they can do it. The stuff you see isn't what happens with most people. So it's kind of where I'm at. Thank you, Pat. Hey, Tom, welcome back to the board. Uh, introducing Tom Bullock, and uh, you're on. Hey, thank you. It's nice to be back. Um, I think Pat Hatchell just hit the nail on the head. Um, you know, all of you made astute commentary about, about how, you know, we need to be more inclusive and accepting. Um, but I, I think for the most part that we are, and, and I think the strongest among us will, will lead and, and help others see that as well and, and treat each other with respect. And, you know, like they did in the old days, come back and have conversations like they did in Minnesota, Darren. I mean, I, I think we need to be more respectful of each other in that way. Uh, Mike or Brian, would you like to add anything? Well, what Pat said was probably the most encouraging thing that I've heard in a long time because you're right, you know, all you see is division on the news, but if people on the street and people that you're coming in contact with are more reasonable than they're being depicted to be in the news, then I'm encouraged. 
I, Brian, would you like to add anything? Sorry to put you on the spot. Your silence told me no, but I'm still calling on you. I, I have nothing to add uh, beyond the, the wisdom of, of the board members. Great. All right. Well, well thank you. One of us all, right? <laughs> thank you for engaging that question. Um, approval of minutes. Uh, we have our minutes from our last board meeting on September 21st. Can I have a motion to approve? A motion. Thank you, John, and a second. I'll second. Thank you, Pat. Um, any comment? Any comment? Any corrections? Any questions? All that. All right. Hearing none. Um, uh, all those in favor of approving the minutes, say aye. 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 Any opposed, nay? Tom Bullock right. abstains. Thank you, Tom. Noted. Um, public comment. Uh, for those of you who would like to make public comment, um, at the beginning of our COVID time and doing these Zoom meetings, we had moved our um, public comment to the end of the meeting, uh, just for kind of figuring things out and uh, being able to try this new technology. Uh, I wouldn't say we have the hang of it now for certain, but we are moving it back to the front of our meeting. And so for any of you who are in attend, uh, are in the attendees uh, uh, participants area, if you raise your hand, uh, we will uh, give you your three minutes um, for any kind of public comment that you would like to make for our meeting tonight. Carla, I see that your hand is up but we do have you on uh, our next comment or our next section for um, agenda item number four uh, to talk about the perk. And I see that you put your hand down. So I'll assume that you don't want to say anything for the public comment. Any public comment? Okay, uh, let's move on then to item number four. Uh, no one else saw any uh, comment there, right? Or any kind of notice that someone wanted to speak? All right, we will move on to item number four uh, to look in on our uh, regional project status reports. Uh, first, we'll start with the county. And I believe that will be Eric Baker uh, who will be presenting for us. Eric, are you? Okay, let me find Eric and bring him in just a moment. I'll stop sharing. I will pay attention to participants. Eric Baker. Promote to panelist. And unmute Eric, there you go. Is there anybody else that will be speaking with you? Uh, no, I am all alone. All right. All right, well, um, I just wanna confirm uh, the amount of time uh, for each one of us, uh, 10 minutes, then Q&A, uh, or how, how much time do I have? The, the time will vary for the different projects just because of uh, different items that you're addressing, Eric. Uh, take, take the time that you need, but uh, we have a long meeting uh, ahead of us, so your brevity is appreciated. Not a problem. I'll try to leave some oxygen left over for everybody else. Um, I'm going to share my... Oh, I, I am I'm disabled from screen sharing. Mike, can you... Uh, Oh, uh, let's see what I can do about that. Oh, I'm in the wrong place here. Panelist, Eric Baker, more. Sorry to be a problem child right off the bat. Oh, oh there we go. Got it? I am free. All right. All right. Well, let me 
get this up and running. I want to thank everybody very much for this time today and uh, thank you for the partnership with uh, the Public Facilities District in our Port Gamble project. Can everybody see the screen that I have up? That yep. Big blue. Okay. Yep. Excellent. Um, I, I understand that uh, we have uh, some new board members, so you kind of wanted us just to kind of go over a little uh, uh, kind of briefly what our project is about and then kind of launch into some other financial related uh, matters. So um, just to, to uh, kind of refresh everybody, uh, our project is associated with the Port Gamble Heritage Park. That is the uh, 3,500 acre park directly to the south of Port Gamble in North Kitsap. Um, one of the things that has been made abundantly clear by COVID, but was in existence before COVID, uh, was the economic impact that outdoor recreation has been bringing to both the state of Washington and our region. Um, the importance of outdoor recreation brings in about $26.5 billion in direct revenues uh, statewide, and that's on an annual basis. When you take a look at indirect costs, that number is almost $40 billion. Obviously, the, some of our national parks take a big chunk of that, but it is starting to spread throughout uh, the region and Kitsap County. There's been substantial growth in this industry over the last 10 years. And I don't know about you, but it seems like everybody who's been on some form of vacation or trip with their family since COVID has been around has been showing pictures from some national park, some state park, some trail system, some mountain biking opportunity. COVID has made outdoor recreation even more important than it ever was before and an economic engine as people are looking for ways to get healthy, to stay out of the way of COVID while still spending time with their families. Uh, the Port Gamble Heritage Park, again, like I mentioned, is 3,500 acres located here just south of Port Gamble. Um, it includes one and a half miles of natural saltwater shoreline, perfect uh, water, uh, um, water trails and uh, kayaking. Uh, it has 65 miles of ad hoc trails. Uh, those uh, range from goat paths to logging roads. And then uh, the phased acquisition of this has been going on for some time. Um, this project has uh, been a number of years in the making, but we had successfully uh, leveraged about $11 million of local, state, and federal funding to the acquisition of all of this property. Now the question is, what is the future of this property and how can we leverage it for, the, for Kitsap County, both for its community, for tourism, and for its economy? Um, this is broken up into a number of different components, the first of which is a mountain biking ride park. Uh, for people who are unfamiliar with what those are, that is a um, more active recreation opportunity with a whole bunch of different types of uh, trail amenities and training opportunities. We have mountain biking opportunities throughout Kitsap County, but what you'll find is that this is a place where families from small children all the way up to teenagers can come to one place, they can park, they can go have a, have a good time at the park itself. Um, it, it, it faces, uh, features uh, opportunities for multiple skill levels. It is gonna be 160 acres in, high, in size. Um, probably the closest that we have to this type of amenity in the region is Duthie Hills, which is located out in Issaquah. Um, that is a much smaller uh, park um, with a much smaller uh, trail system being proposed. Um, but even at that, um, they bring in more than 100,000 riders a year. Uh, those 100,000 riders come in, they spend money, and uh, they uh, enjoy themselves in an opportunity that they don't find other places. Obviously, Kitsap County has a, is in a smaller uh, uh, population base, so if we could just achieve 50,000 folks of this, that is going to be a substantial economic draw to, Kits to Kitsap County. Uh, the second element is a regional connector between Seattle and the Olympic Peninsula called the Sound to Olympics Trail. Uh, basically, there are two prongs of this. The one that the county is most focused on is the one that leaves the Kingston Ferry Terminal, travels through the North Kitsap Heritage Park, travels through the Divide property, and then reaches the Port Gamble's, the Port Gamble property. Um, Kitsap County is currently has done a feasibility study for a uh, again a shared use path. This is intended to be 12 feet in width that allows pedestrians, it allows people of multiple abilities as well as mount as mountain bikers, regular bikers, 
uh, to get off the highway while moving north through uh, the Fort Gamble block, while also providing opportunities for equestrian users, which is another big component of our community and another big component of um, a growing economic sector. Um, this uh, trail has uh, been uh, included in the Rails to Trails program that again connects the Discovery Trail to Seattle. It's also now part of the Leaf Line program. And some of the some of the successes from those designations and the participation of the Public Facilities District, I will be able to show you here in a moment. Uh, another component is the Stottlemyer Trailhead. We focused a lot on the Ride Park, which is located up here to the north, connecting up to the Port Gamble uh, town site. We focused on the Sound Olympics Trail, where the initial phase is this red looped area. But this is a 3,500-acre park and a southern element, um, which is the Stottlemyer Trailhead down on, well, of all things, Stottlemyer Road, is the southern connector to this park, which uh, allows folks to park, ride, and will eventually connect up to Kingston, this direction, but then also all the way up to the mountain biking facility and Port Gamble, and then ultimately across the Hood Canal Bridge to the Discovery Trail. Um, this is uh, parking for cars and horse trailers. Again, the, our equestrian community is again growing in its, uh, its uh, energy and also uh, becoming a significant economic driver on both sides of us, both uh, um, east of the Puget Sound and uh, the Olympic Peninsula. But as I indicated, this is a 3,500-acre park. I've talked about about 160 acres and a trail. We know that these are the core elements of this park. These are the things that are going to help draw people here. But the question is, what can this area be beyond that? 3,500 acres is a lot of land. We do have some encumbrances on the properties, what we can and can't do. So what we really need is we need a master plan to show exactly what other possibilities can leverage this, again, world-class mountain, mountain biking park, a shared-use off-road trail that connects up to the uh, eastern Puget Sound. How can we leverage this? And we need a plan to do so. We need to avoid any natural features. We need to ensure we're utilizing what are some gorgeous viewscapes on that property. When you get to the top of the ridge, you can see all the way um, to the Cascades and all the way to the Olympics. We need to be able to leverage those. Um, and then what other types of uses could be allowed on this property? Um, we have no idea going into this. We are doing a full public process for this 3,500 acres to ensure that we know exactly what the community would like to see and ensure that the economic viability, not just of what the, what the Public Facilities District has already um, committed to this project, but what additional opportunities could be made available for additional asks and how we can leverage that to a, a, obtain additional money. What do you see here are just some of the options from adventure courses to uh, campgrounds and um, uh, yurts. This is a, a yurt facility that you see here. So something maybe as big as a lodge or an environmental learning center. This is a very, very pristine area. Again, one and a half miles of natural shoreline. Um, cultural resources of the Port Gamble, and, uh, Port Gamble, Sklalem, and Suquamish tribes can be uh, leveraged in here as well. There are so many opportunities. This master plan is both going to give us the economic background, but also is going to give us um, the, what exactly is best for our community as a whole. Hey, I'll, Eric. I'll, um, I'll pause there for any questions. Yeah, hey, Eric. Uh, Phil Havers here. Um, I was actually just up there, uh, actually yesterday, um, coming off of uh, uh, the old Port Gamble Road, you know, hiked in about, I don't know, two miles or so. And um, uh, I guess the question is, I, I saw there was a, a bunch of uh, clear cutting up there. I mean, huge swaths, including some recent stuff. Yes. What's part of the park? Because I mean, I, I like the design and, and uh, the photos there, but those all showed trees and there were huge stands of clear cut. So, and not only that, but it also showed PUD water and mm -hmm. fire hydrants going in there. I wasn't sure if maybe I was on the outskirts of, of the park area and this is part of a huge plan development or if that's part of the park or what, what is that? Cause everyone was like, what is this development and clear cut? Uh, there, the, when we acquired the property, we had to make a, we had to make a choice. We could buy the trees and the land and acquire probably about 600 acres overall. Um, 
or we could purchase the land and leave a um, timber easement over the top of it, which gives us the opportunity to buy the trees over time, but does allow Pope Resources, now Rainier, to come in and cut trees at, at uh, varying intervals. That only lasts for 30 years, and th at that point, we own the land outright. That is what gave us the ability to take $11 million and turn it into 4,000 acres. Um, 3,500 to 4,000 acres that can be preserved forever. We know they're not going to turn into homes. We know they're not going to turn into McMansions. We know that it is always going to be public ownership. What, what are the hydrants and uh, PUD water hookups for? Um, that actually is, uh, there is a water connection that runs all the way up to Port Gamble. Um, that uh, ridge that you see there is probably the largest deposit of sand in all of Kitsap County. Um, the infiltration is amazing in that area, and we are currently looking to uh, run, uh, well, actually there is, a water line that connects up uh, to uh, the Port Gamble town site um, that is uh, doing away with a bunch of what were uh, surface wells that are located in our ownership. Um, these surface wells were environmentally damaging and not particularly good for drinking water purposes as well as it allows the PUD to um, do uh, a little more water planning where they can move water around their system versus uh, they have a lot of water in central Kitsap. They don't have as much water in North Kitsap. It gives them a greater ability to move water from place to place, not have to draw so much water from Kingston. If Kingston grows, to be able to move it from some other location. If you're not looking at development that's going to be going in around those, um, those uh, pipes, um, that is just the transmission line um, that is in place. And we're working to ensure that our trail system works around those cleared areas as much as possible so we can limit the amount of clearing. But as I did mention, we do have an agreement with Rainier that we are able to buy back trees over the next 30 years. And we have a number of organizations that are currently working towards that, at that end right now. Yeah, I saw a sign that said, you know, end of clearing area. Are they going to be doing more out there? I mean, it's a huge swath. Or yeah, are they, they taking a couple of years off letting some of that area grow up? The way that uh, forestry uh, works is they don't cut a whole bunch all at one time. They do one clear cut and then they let it sit for five years. It's called greening up of the area. So over the course of time, you're going to be seeing cuts, um, years of, of no cuts, um, and then a cut again. One thing I do want to highlight about the uh, timber stands in the Port Gamble forest is they were built for monoculture or forestry. They are built solely to make money off of trees. They don't provide a natural forest. They don't provide diverse habitat. Um, ultimately, if you take a look at some of those stands that were in place, it looked more like um, sleeping, uh, it, it, something out of a bad fairy tale. Um, the trees are dead except for the top portions. Um, there's a lot of clearing that uh, it would need to be done even if we had owned the trees. So the question being, do we end up paying a premium for trees, end up with less land, potentially losing wildlife connectivity and um, uh, trail connectivity if homes are built in certain areas, or do we secure the land forever and then work to obtain the trees after the acquisition? And that is part of the plan, but not part of what I'm asking the Public Facilities District to participate in. Are there other questions? Um, I'm kind of, I'm gonna get out of the uh, PowerPoint and move into a Word document that has a few more numbers associated with it. All right. With that, out of this. Okay, can everybody uh, see this much blanker document? Looks like looks like Word. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thumbs up. Gotcha. Okay. Good. Uh, this kind of walks through the various steps of this project over time. Uh, the first of which was stage one. I think we talked a lot about that right now, which was the acquisition of the land. Uh, when uh, we first talked to the Public Facilities District, we had already been seven years into this project, acquiring all of the land necessary to achieve what we want to achieve. That roughly has been $11 million that has been completed to date. And we are again trying to obtain additional uh, money for uh, acquisition of trees, healthy stands of trees, not necessarily the lesser, uh, the lesser value of trees. 
Um, back in November of 2019, we approached the Public Facilities District, and uh, you very graciously uh, provided us over $1.6 million towards the uh, elements that I pretty much just discussed. That was the ride park. That's the Sound Olympics Trail final design and permitting of the upper uh, portion of it. That's the portion that connects the ride park to town and is also the most challenging portion of the Sound Olympics Trail. Again, we want this trail to be available to as many people as possible, differently abled individuals. So it isn't just a matter of uh, doing it as a cloak crow flies. We need to design this around certain topography to uh, minimize grades and uh, make sure that we're staying out of environmental features. So as you're looking at the ride park, roughly uh, between uh, the trails, training area, bathrooms, and parking and uh, access, it's about $1.5 million. Design of the Sound Olympics Trail with another 500,000. Uh, the Stottlemyre uh, permitting instructions, another 2,200. And then the master plan I discussed with another 3,000, uh, $3,775,000. All in all, uh, of the 1.6 that you're providing, the overall project in this first phase, which runs through December 21st, uh, though um, due to COVID and due to a number of other things, that uh, schedule is becoming more aggressive as we're having problems getting volunteers out uh, to do certain work and as well as uh, other related issues. It is a two and a half, $2.6 million overall project of which uh, the public facility district is participating to the tune of 1.6 million at this point. But one thing I wanna highlight is this was our original ask. And again, we are very, very thankful for it. We are gonna be providing the feasibility and economic value of both this investment, but also what comes out of the master plan. And as I'd indicated before, there could be campgrounds, there could be adventure parks. There could, there is of course going to be the remainder of the Sound Olympics trail. Obviously the original investment gets the uh, design and permitting completed. Uh, but we need to construct that over time. And that's one of the exciting things I kind of want to discuss right now. Thanks to, and now move, these are future stages beyond what we have discussed in our interlocal agreement. Uh, it's the construction of that upper portion of the Sound to Olympics Trail. Once it's designed, once it's permitted, the overall cost was roughly a little over $3 million. Thanks to the commitment of the Public Facilities District, we've been able to leverage that investment to the tune of $1.9 million minimum towards the construction of this, of this portion through uh, STP, which is Surface Transportation Program funding. That's federal transportation funding. Again, without the Public Facilities District participation, accessing those additional pots of funding are not, are, are not available. And it's that type of partnership that is going to be important as I discuss some of these other opportunities moving forward. So I could see the county coming back for, on this element, potentially another million dollars from the Public Facilities District to hopefully make this, make this project whole and connect up that component. Let me pause there. If anybody have any, have any questions, I, again, I'm, I'm running out of oxygen here in my own room. So again, as part of phase three, it is uh, the design and uh, permitting of the southern uh, portion of the trail moving down to Stottlemyre. And then the master plan is going to come up with recommendations where, how much, and how should additional economic development opportunities be developed. Here's another, another uh, campground using yurts. A mountain biking ride park of, a, of regional uh, significance is going to draw people who are going to come from further away than they're going to want to drive, and they're going to want to find some place that they could stay. A potential campground facility located on the site could provide that type of, that type of amenity, possibly beyond campgrounds to a lodge facility. Again, this is all going to be dependent on the master planning process, but as those investments come forward, um, we are going to be leveraging private funding. We're going to be leveraging additional public funding from both the state and federal government but there's also a strong possibility that some of these projects could greatly benefit from public facilities district funding. Um, I, what you see here in red is just the breadth of the overall project. Obviously, this is not what we're asking for the public facilities district for, but some element of this project could use an additional few million dollars as we move forward and as we phase this construction. That would depend on exactly what we're looking to build. Campgrounds would be less lodges and environmental learning centers would be more. All of those would be, would be based on uh, future, I use the word future, 
economic uh, benefits and economic asks from the public facilities district. Stage four is the construction of the final leg. At that point, you would have the trail that uh, pretty much uh, meets uh, all users running four miles, uh, connecting up almost half of uh, the distance necessary to get to the Kingston Ferry Terminal. Um, and uh, that currently has a price tag of $2.7 million. Again, we do expect uh, STP funds to be helping us with this as well. And again, participation of the, of the continued participation of the uh, public facilities district will be key to helping leverage um, those funds and uh, gain additional federal dollars. And then ultimately when it comes down to what is the construction of, this, of these facilities uh, that the master plan says are economically viable recreation opportunities as well as sensitive to the environmental features. Again, that is still ranging in the 9 million on the short end. If this is going to be something big, um, some projects have gone up to $100 million. Um, this property is also adjacent to Port Gamble. Port Gamble is a nice, quiet little town right now, but I don't know if anybody's participated in uh, um, Rainier's and uh, OPG's uh, master planning process. They are going to be redeveloping that site over the next five to 10 years. That is going to be a growing area that is also going to be bringing funding into our community that is directly going to be related to the improvements that we do in this park. So basically what I want to indicate to you is that we're making substantial progress. We've brought consultants on both for the master plan and for the development of the ride park. We are on schedule for the uh, ride park at this time, as well as the Stottlemyre uh, trailhead. We are um, running into a few issues with the Sound to Olympics trail design, especially as it applies to that construction money. Uh, the closer we can get design to construction, the better our design and permitting costs are going to be in regards to accuracy. So if we could lump those right up against one another, it would be beneficial. And ultimately that may come involve me coming to you at a later date, asking for, for some additional time beyond our existing end of 20, 2021 time horizon. But also there are a lot of opportunities that are gonna come from this master plan that I currently can't tell you what are, going, what are going to be. And it's the master plan that's gonna educate that. But there's a lot of opportunities to partner with the public facilities district, leveraging your resources against federal state resources, private funding um, towards uh, an incredible uh, project for the north end of the county. I will pause there or stop if you'd like me to. Any other questions? Yeah, Eric, uh, Tom Bullock here. Um, I I'm curious if you're monitoring usage now, and I know we're in sort of crazy time and there may have been an impact from COVID, but are you monitoring the volume of, of users that are enjoying the, the park now? And will you continue to do that to kind of benchmark, uh, you know, what, where you see usage rates to be in say five to 10 years? Yes, yes, we are, cur we are currently monitoring them. We see tens of thousands of users annually. That's for the entirety of the 3,500 acres. When I threw out the uh, 100,000 for Duthie Hills, that was just for a small isolated area focused solely on mountain biking. Um, so we are gonna be monitoring that and we have seen a upswing with COVID in all of our parks. During the shutdown, you couldn't find a place to park. You couldn't find a place to park on the side of the road to get to any of our heritage parks countywide. Um, Basically, the 3,500 acres, you figure there'd be a lot of, lot of uh, space for people to spread out. At times, you, could, you couldn't go any distance without seeing other people. And we're talking about 65 miles in many ways of trails. The public, especially in the time of COVID, wants to be outside. They want to get outside. They want to be in safe spaces. And um, they ne don't necessarily want to do that in their backyard all the time. They want to come to someone else's backyard. And we would love to be that backyard. Thank you. Any other questions? Eric, in our literature uh, and in our conversations, uh, 15 and a half million uh, is a number that uh, is talked about or is written down for what the ask, what, what the estimated ask was for uh, yep. the county. Uh, for this project, is that a fair number or would you revise that either lower um, or more given what you shared tonight? 
I would say 15.5 uh, million is a very reasonable uh, number um, when you're talking about continued construction of the full trail system, as well as any one of these potential master plan projects, campgrounds, et cetera. Um, again, um, that would be uh, matched. We're shooting for one-to-one -one with other funds. So a, a $15 million commitment from the public facilities district, we are currently uh, working towards bringing in an additional 15 million in, uh, in development opportunities. Uh, but the master plan is going to be educating uh, exactly what that will be. We don't wanna put something in place that doesn't bring in the economic benefit. So I don't wanna to commit to one thing right now, but I will say that uh, 15.5 million is a reasonable number, probably a little closer to the, um, uh, probably pretty close to the outer rim, the highest rim, um, not necessarily in the middle, but probably in the, in the higher echelons of what we'd be asking for over time. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much, Eric. And uh, we'll move now into uh, 4B. Um, well, actually, it looks like we're moving into, are we moving into the Paul's Poe Perk project, Mike? Uh, no, I started uh, bringing in the wrong people early. So I apologize okay. to so, uh, Paul's Poe. We'll uh, I'll correct that, but I will bring in um the port orchard people at this point uh, so we will move to is here we'll move to 4b which is the port orchard um skcec uh and mayor patansu and nick bond will be uh giving us an update actually it'll be steve rice yeah. oh all right yeah right so I'm going to give just a little, uh, be a little brief, and then I'm going to hand this over to Steve Rice, who's probably got some pretty pictures and a better story than I do. So I'm um, excited to, to be here tonight. We uh, I've uh, I shared last week with our city council. This is probably the, the the weekly meeting that I have Steve with Steve Rice and his team and my team at the city at City Hall is uh, the best Zoom meetings uh, that I'm having. You know, we're doing some really exciting stuff. Uh, we're in the midst of our site selection process. We had a, 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 ran a survey for a couple of weeks within our community. We had over 500 participants and I'm really excited about that. We don't have all of the results. I've seen some of them and uh, it's really gonna drive us for drive the process to what those other uses are in the building. And we're well on track to have our site selected and, and, uh, and the, the uses identified uh, by the end of the year. So we're moving pretty fast. Um, and John Morrissey has joined our steering committee and has been uh, uh, making himself available to us and has been a great addition uh, to our team. So uh, thank you, John. So with that, Steve, if you could, uh, I think you're going to probably want to share your screen if you can. If Michael let you. Okay, yeah, I'll need to fix that just a moment. Okay. Void, should be able to share now, Steve. As I say, in the void, I'll thank the mayor for his kind words and uh, just let you all, I now know way more about sewers and pump houses and shorelines than I ever knew before. So it's been a learning process as well as fun. Hi, everybody. Can you see my screen now? Yep, sure can, Steve. Yes, Great. Can. Great. Thanks, everybody. Hi, Mike and Commissioner uh, Mayor Putansu. Good to see all of you and thank you for having us uh, uh, give an update today. Um, I'll try, I know you have a long meeting and so I'll try not to be long winded and uh, I'll skip over uh, the highlights for you today, but we're here to give you an update on progress for the South Kitsap Community Event Center. Um, as mayor said, it's going really well. I can tell you that at, at a high level, the news is all very good. Um, our task one work under the ILA between you and the city of Port Orchard is going well. There's tons of community participation. We are on schedule. Um, 
We have a large um, consultant team. We are uh, 10 disciplines altogether spread to seven firms. Uh, we're having great meetings and there's really a nice spirit of uh, communication and participation between everybody. Um, on the, on my, uh, on my screen tonight, I think uh, I want to talk a couple minutes just about communication. Then I want to go through our task one, um, our general task areas, and just give you an idea of what our progress is. So, um, Lori Cook, our, our Rice Fergus Miller project manager, has been engineering all of the uh, coordination between uh, all of the, the project's constituents and stakeholders. Um, we routinely meet with four different groups. Um, we, we meet with uh, a steering committee, which includes the mayor and Nick Bond, the planning director, uh, Jill Jean from the library system, and your own John Morrissey. John, thank you for uh, always being there for us. Really appreciate it. And from time to time, we'll have an invited guest. Uh, at our next meeting, we'll have the uh, superintendent of uh, South Kitsap School District join us, Tim Winter. Um, we also meet um, and update the city council. We just did that last week. Uh, we meet uh, once, a month with, once a month with them. We also perform an update to the city's economic development and tourism committee. And that's always interesting. And... Um, we meet with a group of shareholders that includes Kitsap Bank and the private development players. If you remember, this project is part of a uh, larger master plan on the west end of Port Orchard. So all of those conversations are going and it's nice to come here and also uh, talk with you. So um, I have a few slides to share with you. I'll try and make this a little bit, a little bit larger. Um, our schedule, is uh, up here across the top. We're in our, what we call our task one from your ILA. We split that into two pieces. Uh, the first of those pieces is largely about public outreach and programming and our site assessment and then doing some concept planning on those sites. And uh, you can see the timeline spread across the top here. Uh, the red line was our update to uh, city council last week. So we're now just to the right of that. We're in this last week of, of October. And um, all of the tasks outlined here, up and down and across the sheet, are in one color or another. Um, whether it's the city and design team tasks to do, only the design team tasks to do, and where our deliverables come into play. So um, for instance, for public outreach and programming, you can see that every, um, every item is on the list, which ones are checked off. Um, so we're staying on schedule and we're due to wrap up this piece of work um, by making a final presentation to the city council on December 15th. And they will be making an action to move forward, which then you will see in January. Um, we're working uh, now, we finished our site assessments for site restrictions and opportunities. And we're just now starting to work on concept plans at three different sites downtown. Uh, the mayor said that we've had really great participation um, in our um, community outreach reach piece. And that is another um, required element in the ILA. Um, the survey was um, open uh, between September 28th and October 16th, was actually extended a couple of days. Our sub-consultant, Sarah Tonin, is doing a really amazing job on this. Um, as you know, uh, we've had really great participation, and I wanted to show you an example of what kind of results are coming back. This is just one of the results. Um, which of all the responses um, got the highest yes vote and it has to do with uh, our community thinks it's very important that this uh, facility extends its, its usability by having covered outdoor areas in connection 
with the building itself. And we've been planning that all along. Um, and you can see sort of how the responses are working. Also space for community festivals was a big deal. Um, when we closed, we realized that there were over 625 um, entries. So 625 participants. And one thing that I wanted to mention to you is as part of the um, strategy for this outreach, we elected to, um, under the label of equity, uh, take some action in reaching out to groups that um, maybe uh, had not participated before, maybe assume that um, their voice won't make a difference. Um, we approached um, over 100 different organizations for their input and um, ask specifically that they weigh in on, on the outreach process. And, you know, we went to uh, the non-city service providers like sewer and water districts, fire and transit. We went to uh, Rotary Clubs, the Port Orchard Bay Street Association, uh, Kitsap Economic Development Alliance, KEDA. Um, we haven't made specific presentations, but we outreach to them and ask them to, to get involved. Um, Puget Sound Regional Council, so reaching a little bit farther, military groups, educational groups, and including school district and the college, Olympic College, uh, Leadership Kitsap, uh, South Kitsap Student Body Leadership, Fathoms of Fun folks, Manchester Community Association, social and welfare, and religious groups like KCR, Coffee Oasis, Stand Up For Kids, South Kitsap Helpline, Washington Veterans Home, Retzel, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of business groups. And of course, all of the library's contacts. Library maintains contacts with the Friends of the Library, volunteers, their board of trustees, their foundation board, and they have a very close relationship with the Puget Sound Genealogical Society. So we've made every effort to um, leverage this outreach um, to as many corners of our community as we can. And we get better answers that way. Um, I'll walk you through a little bit of how the programming is coming along. Obviously, it's not 100%, it's probably 90. We didn't want to close the programming until we had received every piece of public input um, and I'll just give you a taste for what it looks like. We've presented all of this to the steering committee. You see there's a little bit of a color piece here. For those of you who maybe aren't as familiar with the CEC, um, it is providing an event space, a new library, what we call collective space, which holds everything together, and, um, and some other things for consideration uh, in downtown Port Orchard as part of a West End master plan on a piece of property on Bay Street, one side or the other. And um, what our program documents look like if we stay in blue for a minute and we talk about event space, which of course is synonymous with meeting space. I just picked one page out of the document. We are catalog cataloging la um, large event spaces, medium event spaces or meeting rooms, small event spaces and meeting rooms, Obviously, this is just the page dedicated to the latter of those two. And I want you to know that we're drilling down on the kinds of uses that the spaces would be available for, the capacity in each case, depending on how they are set up in a conference setting with rounds for maybe a dinner, uh, a classroom setting, uh, setting with mostly chairs or a wide open non-fixed seats kind of thing. So in each case, we go through this and build our program. Here's a similar one. Purple is the library side of things. One of the exciting things that the library is planning and programming into this facility is what they call a light lab, which stands for learn, innovate, uh, technology, and explore. It's a little bit um, uh, inspired by new movements into what we call co-working if you've ever been to a co-working space um as you know or or may know kissap regional library has um partnered to provide a small business resource center in their branches 
And so one of those will be coming to Port Orchard. Uh, it's a tutoring center and with COVID, of course, that's been very popular um, and lots of technology access. So it's, uh, it's a really cool thing that would be um, something that we would be bringing to Port Orchard. This all wraps up into an overall program. And when we came to you um, a year and a half or two years ago to pitch this project, we were estimating we would be somewhere in the neighborhood of 24,000 square feet in all. And we are hovering between 22 and a little over 25. And we have a ways to go to refine the program, of course. Uh, but in the big picture, rather than take you through all of these the pure event space and meeting space is coming in at about 5,000, which is what we thought. The library at about 11, which is commensurate with the new one being constructed in Silverdale right now. It's about 12. And then these collective spaces that includes all of the circulation between the rooms, the stairways, uh, a shared lobby, which will be a feature in the building. And you can see that between the event space and the collective space, we have about 12, five available for events very much like we were uh, looking at before, plus the library space. So this building will be designed in such a way that some of the library space can also be added to the collective space in the event space to stage really interesting events, maybe on more than one level with spaces open to one another. And it can be, I think, um, the most interesting and fun event space in the county. But I'm biased, of course. In our site options, I think you've seen maybe an earlier version of this before. Um, the West End master plan is roughly where my cursor is. We've also looked outside the master plan um, to test things because we don't want to miss an opportunity. Um, but we are uh, just now starting design to test the concept of this 24,000 foot program on a, what we call a combination of sites two and six, both of whom are both of which are owned by Kitsap Bank and Kitsap Bank today sits right here. Um, site three and four, the old Myery site, which I'm sure many of you know on the corner of Bay Street and Sydney and where the current library sits, which we call site four, that's a city owned property. And then also site five, which is the non-water or the upland side of Bay Street, which is right here. So um, for uh, each of those, the team has completed its um, phase one site assessment reports. And what those are, are a list that looks something like this, where for each site, we have done our zoning homework, uh, our shorelines homework, uh, topographic work, uh, investigated utilities, um, some very preliminary structural on the sites, preliminary geotechnical uh, transportation, had an archeological study done, and of course the biological side, which is the water side of this, given that some of the sites have the potential for shorelines mitigation. That's a very exciting part of the project. Um, shorelines portion would not be funded by the KPFD, but if we could leverage this project to do some of that for Port Orchard, that would be terrific. Uh, here is a permitting plan. So doing our homework on, depending on which site is chosen, um, what sort of permits and approvals would be required and of whom and the duration of time. So covering our bases there. i uh, show you this again. If we were to zoom in on the site two plus six combination or option A, uh, our constraint mapping is done. So we understand what size of a facility we could get on either one, considering all of the, sh all of the setbacks, the zoning code, utilities, easements, that kind of thing. And then lastly, I just wanna wind it up for you to let you know that um, we are starting concept design. Last piece of uh, um, our task one and our plan as we agreed with you in the ILA is to do a 
concept building design on all of the three site options, A, B, and C. Um, that is looking like uh, sites two, site three, and site five. And we have a scoring matrix that we're developing. We're gonna share with city council tomorrow. And um, the outcomes, which is what the, is really important here, the outcome for the best CEC on any of these sites will be evaluated and decided and we'll package all of that with our due diligence and present it to the city council on December 15th. And um, with your blessing in January, we would go into your task two, which is to create a full schematic and cost estimate um, on the chosen and selected site. And we will have a recommendation for the site selection in our December package to the city. So that was pretty quick. Um, it's been a really, really fun project to conduct and the parties are working together really well. Um, I can't wait for December, um, not making any judgments yet, but uh, there are gonna be some very promising uh, concepts come out of this work. And uh, I would open it up now for either further comment from the mayor, thank you, Rob, for being here, or for questions from any of you. Questions for Steve or I? Everybody's happy? You just did a good job. You did a good job, Steve, thank you. You're welcome. It's hey. a pleasure. I would ask you uh, just that ending question of 12 million is the number that is often connected to the Port Orchard uh, project. Is that still a, a fair number or would you yeah. estimate it would be lower or higher? Thanks for the question. I can answer it two or three different ways. Um, 12 million is the ask portion of roughly a $20 million project. And COVID has done some interesting things to the supply of building materials across North America, if not the world. Yeah. Um, materials are, at the moment, harder to come by. Lead times are longer. There's a scarcity of some things. Um, we are doing a project in Silverdale now, uh, about 8 million in size, and the contractor informed us that the cost of lumber has increased 100% since March 15th. Um, it's a very strange kind of world out there. And so I think there's an asterisk with all of this. You know, we will be delivering a full cost estimate when we get to um, the spring. And I'm very curious to see what it is. Um, Everyone is working, everyone is busy, which is really great. I think if we can get the material scarcity figured out, and certainly by the time this building is under construction, that will have been figured out. Um, Darren, our other approach here is um, something that I brought up to the city in our interview um, process with them. You saw us running two sets of numbers in our program where we have both a smaller square footage and a larger total square footage with about three or 4,000 feet in between. And we intend to keep that going um, through the rest of this task. I would like to deliver um, a project that is flexible and interesting and isn't overbuilt in any way, except that you can use it in really interesting ways to stage an event that's really larger than you should be able to do in the building. And, um, you know, we're, we're all very interested in making sure that we have a slightly smaller facility that is busy all the time than a slightly larger facility that, um, you know, has, has, uh, less use and more of that, you know, beautiful waterfront square footage, you know, sitting without occupants. And so we want to make this project just as tantalizing as possible. And if that means 
something slightly smaller with a little more a little more site work and the ability to use some covered outdoor space. I think that's a good answer. And right now we're holding to our $20 million uh, preliminary budget. Thank you. Uh, you know, but, I would just say that, you know, we're, we're looking, this is a great opportunity to activate and, you know, revitalize our downtown. And as we uh, told the public facilities district, when you made us your, your top project, this this is a three and I've said this multiple times to this process to various groups. It's three legged stool here. The community center is one piece of it. The bank headquarters is the second piece, and and the third is the the housing element and the 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 mixed use project. And they all three have to come. They, they aren't going to be built on the same day, but they're we're, we're committed to all three phases of that because it, it doesn't work. The community center. Or it doesn't work without the other partners. And, and that was the commitment we made to you. And, and uh, we're committed to making all three phases uh, happen uh, and for this to be successful. Thank you, Mayor. Any other questions? I think we need to work with Eric to buy some of that timber so that we can keep it local. And there we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that sort of fits in with the story that we are starting to think about for um, the story that's told inside this building about the Kitsap community. I'll save the rest of it for later, but it will also involve the North End. And, and we're looking forward to I, you won't see us again until uh, January. You know, uh, we owe it to our city council to give them the first glimpse of this uh, potential new facility in December. And it's after your December meeting. So we'll be back uh, at your January meeting. So pencil us in and uh, we're going to share some exciting stuff. All right. I'll talk Thank with you. Darren and uh, we'll probably do a staggered. Uh, status update with the projects <clears throat> so will we do like uh, one a month through the quarter and then we'll repeat each quarter or something like that all right let's move on to 4c thank, thank you, you everybody. again steve thank you mayor patansu uh, and move on to the paul's pope perk and mike would you bring in carla I'll, and i'll go back and team. get them again Carla, Mary, Peter, and <clears throat> Mary or Carla, who's going to do most of the talking? Who do I need? Are you going, you're going to do a, a PowerPoint. So uh, yeah, I have the PowerPoint. So if you can um, enable me to share my screen, Mike, I would really I, appreciate it. I will do that now. Thank you. Okay. okay. And Mary, you have a question. Your hand is raised. Am I in there twice in your waiting room? Yes. Can you let the other Mary in? Because there's it's Becky, <laughs> the mayor. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's only one of me, but I have two. I I have two. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'll uh, I'll get Mary Bicky Be Mary Bic Becky in. Whew, couldn't get that out. All right, so um, good evening, Kitsap uh, Public Facility District Board and Mike and Brian. It's such a pleasure for us to be here this evening. I'm Carla Bouton. I'm the Planning and Economic Development Director here at the City of Polsbo. And with me is Mary McCluskey, our Parks and Recreation Director, and per Peter Batuello, who is the PERC Project Manager. We are pleased to provide you a short PowerPoint tonight, um, letting you know about the work that we've accomplished uh, this year since our ILA has been in place. And uh, Mary is going to start us off with uh, our, the beginning of our PowerPoint here. 
All right, so tonight we would like to give you a, a summary of the project, progress of the work that we have accomplished under the interlocal agreement. We wanna talk about our public launch, which happened last Friday and the work that we have ahead of us. And then our phased approach to project delivery and funding. First of all, we wanna talk a little bit about what's, remind you what's important about the PERC. There's a lot of important pieces, but number one, it's a public public project at this point. It's the city of Paulsbo and it's the Kitsap Public Facilities District. We know we're going to have a lot of other partners in with the project, but right now, this is definitely the first step as a public public pro project. This, is, uh, this project will fulfill the public facility legislation. It will be a regional center with convention, conference, and special event type areas. There will be a center available to the public for community and sporting events, trade shows, artistic presentations and performances. And this is the only Kitsap Public Facility District funding project that has a fields, sports fields and multi-use recreation. We want to be able to host upcoming tournaments again. Another important thing about the perk is that we are connected literally by our property lines with two and four year education institutions. Olympic College, Paulsbo, and Western on the Peninsulas are both located in the same building, of course, but on our north side. And then the other benefit is to local business. College Marketplace is busy, it's booming, there's no more going on up there. There's a hotel that's uh, fully under construction that is supposed to be done by fall of 2021. And we just feel like the partnership between business and the perk and the city and the colleges is just a perfect place to be. So just a summary of the project, the PERC is a collaboration between the city of Paulsbo, the Kitsap Public Facilities District, and the Kitsap community at large. This is what we envision, but until we see our results from the survey, you know, things are probably gonna change just slightly, but what we envision is a 20,000 square foot event center probably on the top floor because that's the floor that can see Mount Rainier. 20,000 square feet of class classroom space with audiovisual, commercial catering kitchen, fitness facilities, meeting rooms, and administrative space for the Parks and Recreation Department. We envision four acres of all season lighted turf fields for multi-use sporting, recreational, entertainment events. There are parcels that we'll talk about in a little bit, but there are parcels that are available for sale contiguous to our property. And this, the most important part is that this project will be located on six acres of city owned property that we already own. So here's the map, uh, that's highway three right in the middle. And so first of all, it's easy access to a major highway. You head north, you're gonna go to the Hood Canal Bridge, Jefferson County, Clown County. If you head south, you're gonna go to Silverdale, Bremerton, Tacoma. If you head kind of the other south, <laughs> southeast, you're gonna to go to Bainbridge and the Kingston and to the ferries. But this is an ideal location, college marketplace. There you see the colleges to our north of the perk. You see the Fairfield Inn that is under construction slightly to the east. And you see lots of retail shopping and restaurants in the rest of the space. So just a reminder of how we got to this, because I do know you have some new board members. The Public Facility District made a call for proposals in 2018. We submitted in December of 18, presented the, the proposal in March of 2019. The PERC ranked number two of seven projects in July. We negotiated the ILA between August and November of 19. And both the City Council and the Kitsap Public Facility District Board approved the ILA in December of 2019. First of all, our phase one fe feasibility from the Kitsap Public Facility District was 243,900. City match is in the form of staff time. We have two departments working hard on this project, the Planning and Economic Development Department and the Parks and Recreation Department and different staff members within both departments. The agreement is for the city and the PFD to work together during this first phase to evaluate feasibility. And this should include and will include community outreach, market and financial analysis, a concept plan or determination of uses, site planning, and a facility management plan. 
So we're ha happy, thank you, Mary. Uh, we're happy to give you our progress report on the work that we've accomplished since our ILA. Our KPFD coordination and project management, we did select, uh, we issued an RFP and selected a project manager. Uh, Mike Walton was a member of our selection committee and worked through that process with uh, a larger uh, selection committee. We've been meeting with Mike, or we've been providing Mike by monthly progress reports, as well as in-person, of course, virtual coordination meetings with uh, your executive director. We've made two reimbursement requests to him, and we are maintaining a spending plan and financial tracking of the funds that we provide to your executive director as well. The first phase of our, or the first, the first task in our uh, phase one feasibility is community outreach. And we are so excited uh, that, uh, well, actually, sorry, that's the next slide. <laughs> so we have the website and community preference survey launch, which was Friday. We've established a steering committee and we've also hired a consultant um, to work with us on a select basis. So it's not, it's as needed consultant for our community engagement. But this is the slide I was super excited to show with all of you guys because we did have our website launch on Friday. This is a snapshot of our um, front page here and we are uh, engaging with a survey. And this is a community or a, a community pre uh, preference survey where the, the questions of the survey are asking them what uses, very specific uses would they like to see and support in the perk. Uh, so we have a web page set up, we have our email set up, we have mailed postcards to 5,200 addresses. That is uh, all city residents and that, that postcard is going to ask them to take the survey. We emailed, uh, we emailed out today nearly 15,000 email addresses asking for them to come to our web page and take our survey. And we had a social media blast starting on Friday. And within 24 hours, we had 20,000 hits um, on our social media. So we're so excited and encouraged about the oh. community engagement. Yay, thank you, Mike. We're very <laughs> excited about it. We really think that the community was ready for this and uh, we can't wait to see what our survey results are gonna be. So the next, what we have been working concurrently as well as the other tasks of our ILA, we have uh, market and financial analysis reports that we, oh, the, the public facility district, we went through an RFP process. We selected Burke Consulting to provide our market and financial analysis, uh, analyzing the PERC and providing their ability, um, you know, demonstrating it, their ability to support it in the market and the financial piece of it. They will also provide input to the facility management plan, which will primarily be uh, created by city staff, but with consultant assistant, excuse me. And then our next step that we're working on right now is our concept plan, which is the determination of uses. We have two things going on uh, concurrently. We have a preliminary discussions with College Marketplace with to explore options to acquire adjacent parcels if necessary, as we work through our concept plan. And then we'll be issuing the RFP for consultants and there'll be uh, firms, uh, architectural firms that will help with our determination of space and uses as well as the site planning will be a component of that as well. So looking ahead for the next couple of months, we will con uh, continue with our community outreach. We're gonna have the results of our first preference survey. Uh, our survey will go through, I think, November 16th. And we also will have a follow-up survey most likely in, in um, January. We're gonna convene the steering committee and we will facilitate those steering committee work groups as well. We will engage with Burke and their work on the market analysis and we will begin drafting a management plan and we will hire the concept planning consultant and retain an architect for the space planning and concept site plans. Now this piece here is really exciting as we started to put this together. This shows you our timeline. And as you'll recall in our initial uh, presentation and our proposal, we did propose a phase approach to the PERC. We laid out that it was a three phased approach and that we would take each phase separately and come to the PFD upon completion of one uh, before we move to phase two or phase three. So where we're at here is the um, phase one, 
is our feasibility study. And that we do anticipate that that will be concluding at some point in 2021. Then mo moving to phase two, our request to the KPFD after the city council resolves to pursue phase two funding, which will probably be, in a, be at about a year from now, we will come back to the PFD requesting funding for our phase two, which is design and development between 1.75 and 2 million for that phase. Then we will engage in our phase two design and development, which will be the final uh, A&E uh, plans. We'll have our recreational facility planning, our site engineering, capital facility strategies. This is where we'll start laying out, finalizing what, part, what financial partners we'll have, our partner agreements, and then the construction plans and specs. And then moving to phase three, we will resolve, the city council will resolve to move forward with phase three. This is where our community vote will occur. And you, you have known from the beginning as well as we have that a community vote for, uh, the, for our portion of the funding will be necessary. So we'll have a community vote somewhere, you know, either fall of 2023 or 2024. And then we will make the request to the KPFD for the remaining share of the construction and then phase three is the construction phase of the event center, the outdoor recreation, the indoor recreation, and all the perk amenities, which we're anticipating between 2023, 20, sorry, 2025 and 2026. So with that, that concludes our PowerPoint presentation. And we are all here, as well as Mayor Erickson, um, to answer any questions that the board has. And just again, thank you for our opportunity to present uh, progress we've made and uh, where we're going from here. We're all very excited. <laughs> Any questions? Mr. Chair, I have a comment real quickly. Yes. Um, we put the social media blast out and we were completely overwhelmed with the, res with the response. Um, all you know, two point two in uh, two two thousand engagements means people actually click through and engage in response. Um, overwhelmingly uh, positive response. Um, I want to remind um, this group um, that this is being built for the people. Um, this is for our citizens. Um, this is for our kids. Um, we need these recreational facilities in the North End, the fields, an aquatic center, all of these pieces, plus the ability to partner with the hotel, which is now three stories high. It's wood framed and ready to go and is on schedule um, to for events and the economic impact that this will have, plus, plus the relationship between Western Washington University and Olympic College, which is right next door, they would be able to use this facility for conferences, symposiums, all of that. It's all of them all mixed together. And the response has been absolutely amazing by our public. We are asking them to vote to tax themselves. And the response is still positive, very positive. So, you know, I'm, I'm amazed, I'm thrilled. And I'm really proud of um, the citizens of the greater Paulsbo area that they're so responsive to this concept. Uh, they really want this. Um, they want a new pool facility. They want the ability to have recreational classes. They need an area for conferences um, without, you know, going on down to Bremerton or, or in an area. We need them in the North End. And so I, I'm... Um, I'm so thrilled that everybody else is seeing that same vision. Uh, Mayor Erickson and Carla, um, the number in the ILA, I believe, is 35 million for the total project. And the number that we talk about or that I have written down in our documents uh, is somewhere th that the ask is somewhere between 12 million to 18 million. Is that number still uh, an accurate number? Or would you again move that lower or higher? Well, I think that that's a great accurate, that's an accurate number for planning purpose for right now. Of course, our um, what we plan to do is find partners 
to join with us and the perk and do a capital, um, you know, capital funding uh, program and outreach. So I think that one, once we have a final construction dollar, which is will come out of phase two, the, the final cost estimate, then we'll be able to have, that will also be where we're engaging with our capital funding. And then we'll have a number that we will then split with the PFD and half of it will go to the vote, something like that. I, I think that I, P, uh, Peter, our project manager might have a little bit of a more eloquent way of answering your question. So Peter, if you wanna pop on and, and, and provide Darren a little bit more detail than probably what I'm pro providing. <laughs> Sure. Thanks, Carla. Uh, good to see everybody. I think uh, where we're at in our process, we're still trying to scale the facility to the community need. Um, it's very important for us to really understand the components that will uh, aggregate into this facility. We have a structure, we have events, we have recreation, we have fields. Well, there's a lot of detail that goes into that, and there's a lot that the community has to say about what they what they want that to be. And then of course, we have to understand what the market will bear. Um, so those two pieces uh, that we're, we're working on now will really help us scale the facility. And obviously the scale of the facility will drive the cost. So I think Carla's right for where we are now, that's a really good planning number. Um, it's probably toward the upper end of what scale we can achieve on this site and, and for these activities. So um, we'll see how well the community supports, uh, supports the, the need for it and see how well they're, they're willing to pick up uh, their share of it. So that's what we hope the feasibility study will tell us. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? All right. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, Carla. Uh, yep. Mayor you, Erickson, guys. Peter. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> All right, let's move on to uh, item number five on our agenda, financial reports, and 5A, the monthly reports. Uh, Mike, uh, I'll hand this off to you. <coughs> okay, let me get to the right place here. That's not the right place. Here we go. <clears throat> okay, the, uh, oops, I need to share that. Okay, now we're sharing. <clears throat> we're looking at the sales tax rebate revenue summary showing the results from September, <clears throat> $167,000 plus. Uh, again, this is the third month in a surprising string of uh, receipts that were above the level of 2019. 157,000 plus last year, and we're at 167,000 plus this year. <clears throat> so, uh, just to finish up, the uh, we've done $70,000 of debt service payments, which we pay each month. The net of uh, just under $100,000 and the expenses of around $18,000, leaving us just under $80,000 that went to uh, cash proceeds in our account. 
but the key is that was up six and a half percent, six point six percent over last year, and that's been fairly steady the last three months. We had three down months and then three up months. If we continue on the same uh, avenue, we'll wind up approximately the same as we did last year, around $1.8 million. So it'll probably be somewhere between the $1.7, $1.8 million for the year. Any questions about that? Any comments? In the uh, other financial sheets, we have uh, this is our performance uh, against the budget in the 968 account. That's our operations account. And uh, the result is that uh, we're basically on track with our budget. We're, we're under budget at this point, which we typically are uh, because we don't utilize 100% of what our budgeted items are. And we're still uh, with a cash balance that should pretty much let, get us through the end of the year. The next portion of the financial statements, this is the... Uh, revenue and expenses by fund. The 286 fund in the first column is our uh, debt service fund in which the, uh, the money comes in, it accumulates each month and then gets paid out twice a year, basically in June and December uh, to pay the approximately $850,000 a year that we pay in debt service. The most interesting thing, uh, the 968 fund, as I mentioned, is the operations fund. The 977 fund is our holding fund or, or general fund. And that's where the money accumulates. This column on the second page shows the first payments that we made here on this yellow box notation, the Paul's Bow Perk invoices for the uh, about $15,000 that was paid last month for the first invoices that we have received from Paul's Bow. And there is another one that's uh, in our voucher payments that we'll see later on. Any other questions about the, the financials <clears throat> or the way that we're beginning to report the uh, invoices to track and account for the uh, cost? <clears throat> yeah, I've got a couple questions, Mike. So. Yeah. This statement is not just for the month. This is for year to date on this. So where is the the payment in June for the use of about $850,000 on the bond? Where does that reflect? Uh, it, um, It's the 629,000 that shows in uh, the 286 fund. That's because the uh, full amount hasn't gone out. The, the balance of that goes out in December. So, so that's showing up in, in the assets and in the income side. It, the, uh, yeah, on the income side, that's the accumulation 
um, of the 10 months to date for nine months. So it, so those uh, funds, if you, if you uh, scroll yeah, down, yeah. If you scroll down right there where you're at, um, yeah. I see the balancing 629 for under code chart of accounts 5520. So that's the holding cash account. Am I getting this right? If you go up a few lines, you can see the, the matching 629 number. Right. But it's in account 977. Now, no. No, it comes, it comes into 977 first and then gets transferred to the 286 account where it's held and accumulates. So, all right. Where it says uh, on the 5520 line, uh, payments, federal, state, local, that 645 number is what's been paid out. Well, that should come out of 286, though, not out of. I think this goes back to my question last time about trying to understand these better. So I think to, to kind of second what Aaron's going down is I think for most of us, we're used to looking at a private side. Uh, income statement balance sheet. Uh, I don't. I, I don't know. I'm still trying to learn. Being being new here, uh, how accounting might work in more of a public setting. Um, and and even I'm familiar with another organization I work with. We do fund accounting, uh, which looks similar to this, but not you know, the, the first set of uh, documents you said. So, I, I'd be interested to know what an income statement looks like for the PFD as well. Okay. I'm sorry. Balance sheet. Yeah. Yeah. Because um, and then you said the payments are about eight fifty, but this one's reflecting six twenty nine. Does that mean the one in December uh, is eight fifty is for the full year, and the December oh. payment hasn't occurred yet? So the December payment's only going to be a little over two hundred thousand. Well, no, it should be more than that because the the, the mid year payment on June is just the uh, the interest and the one in. December is interest and principal. Yeah, you, you, you pay interest twice a year, principal only once a year. Okay, so so what's the dollar amount that's going to hit in December? I, I think what he was trying to say, Aaron, is don't forget you still have to do that. Was it 80 some thousand a month for October, November, December? Yes. Is that what our debt service is, I think? Yeah, plus the uh, the previous three months as well yeah and it's eighty thousand a month times 12 months so it's about should be about 900 no it's a little less 60. uh walt it's about eighty thousand a month for 12 months no excuse me seventy thousand a month for 12 right months. okay so 840 000. 40, 840 000. okay which is goes makes sense on the 850 number okay got it i was just trying to look and trying to figure out what depending on how much money we've got in there, how much is already earmarked to go out in December of the 840. Well, it'll, it'll be six something because there's about 120 an interest that's already gone out in June. Any other questions for Mike on the monthly financials? Otherwise, I'm going to move us forward Mike, on approving I, our blanket vouchers. I, I have one, Mike. So, what's the balance in our, uh, uh, you know, our fund that we have to pay these invoices and fund the fund the projects? Um, that balance is not shown on this sheet. No, we didn't get a cash balance sheet this time. I know we did last yeah. time. There's actually five sheets that are generated by our accountant. Um, I'll be happy to supply all five of them. I was trying to provide a, a summary that had pertinent information that you were asking for. And, and this one particularly because it showed the, the invoices for the the first project but i'll give you all five sheets next month and that does have a balance sheet and 
uh, other information that you'll value. So are we right around 3 million? So we're at about 3.3 .3 million now. Um, uh, again, this is just for January through September, so it doesn't show the previous balance. But the, uh, the total is about 3.3 .3 million at this point. Thank you. And if we have performance similar to um, what we've been seeing so far in the future, again, we'll have roughly about another million dollars um, in assets in next year in addition to the 3.3 .3 that there is now. All right, any other questions for Mike? Otherwise I'm gonna move us forward with approving our vouchers. Okay, moving on to 5B, our That's blanket okay. voucher. Yeah, uh, the, this is the KPFD September expenses. I think uh, it speaks for itself. Um, uh, you might, Mike, wanna, Note uh, the October expenses being um, a little more than what they are usually. Uh, actually, they're kind of balanced off a little bit because the legal services have, have gone down. We're not so much into ILAs and changes and so on, but the October expenses for me are up dramatically because of the purchase of a new computer, which is going to be the the technology baseline for us into the next four or five years. The rationale for that two other board members was just that uh, we're, we're Zoom, we're digitally orientated right now and we wanted to make sure that Mike had the right equipment to do the job. I'm working on a five-year-old all-in-one with eight 8K of memory. The new one has 32 gigabytes of memory and one of the fastest uh, Intel processors. So we're going to be uh, gobbling up digits by the billions. So with that, can I have a motion for approval of uh, this voucher? I move approval of the uh, public voucher. Thank the you, Paul. $5,291. And 86 cents. I'll second that. Thank you, Tom. Uh, any discussion? Hearing none, uh, all those in favor of approving uh, the voucher uh, for September, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. All right. Uh, voucher, motion passes, voucher uh, paid. Uh, the 5C, our project voucher approval, this is for the PERC. We just heard an update on the PERC. Um, and this is uh, for uh, another uh, voucher for that uh, project. But um, can I hear a motion for approval of this voucher? I'll move for that. I'll Thank second. you, Tom. Thank you, Aaron. All right, uh, any discussion? Okay, hearing none, um, all those in favor of approving this voucher say aye. 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 Any opposed say nay. Uh, motion approved. Um, now, uh, 5D, update from financial advisor Alan Dashen. Uh, Mike, I don't see him in our participants. Uh, is Alan going to be with us tonight? I had thought he was, but uh, but you're right. I don't see him in the participants either. Uh, let me stop sharing this for a moment. Mike, why don't we do this? I'm going to move us on to 6A for approving the bylaws after we've had those uh, to look at over the last month. And if you want to contact Alan or look into what's going on there, please do. But let's move on to 6A. And um, we discussed uh, these revised bylaws at our last meeting and thought it was good form to just leave it for a month to 
chew on it, look through it again, see if any more questions were raised before approving them. Um, are there any other questions that you have as a board that you'd like to ask Brian or that you'd like to discuss before we uh, uh, see the motion for approving these revised bylaws? All right, um, I'm not seeing any hand waving or anybody voicing in, so I'll take that as uh, we uh, feel good with these. So can I have a motion to approve the revised uh, uh, bylaws? So motioned. John, was that you? Yep. Thank you, John. And a second? I'll second. Thank Walt. you, Walt. And uh, any discussion on this now at this point? All right, then let's uh, vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 If any opposed say nay. All right, uh, we have approved uh, these revised bylaws. Uh, Brian, thank you uh, for your good work uh, as always. Uh, Mike, for the ED activity report, uh, what would you like to share? Okay, uh, hang on one second here. Are we skipping over B, on number six? I have number six B as the ED activity report. What do you have it as? A discussion held over from the last meeting um, about the Port of Bremerton project. Uh, uh, that is now number 9A. Oh, I guess I um, didn't get the revised agenda. Okay. Does everybody else have the revised agenda, or are you in the same spot as Aaron? I have the revised as well. I have the revised agenda. I have the revised agenda. Okay. I, have the revised agenda. Okay. I believe it was an email that came out just today or yesterday, though, Aaron. But that is on our agenda for tonight, Aaron. Got it. Thanks. Yep. 6B, Mike, uh, ED activity report, anything that you would like to share? Yeah, I um, didn't have that in my packet, so I don't have it up there to show you. I apologize for that. But I have it in my folder, so let me get that out. And we'll talk about it. Somewhere in my folder. I apologize, I don't seem to have that in front of me right now. It was here earlier, but I don't see it right now, but I can find it. <clears throat> um, well, let's move on to 6C for the regional facility reports. And I'll just ask that each of you would read those. Um, and uh, Mike, were you able to contact or did you hear anything from Alan? No, I haven't heard anything from Alan. Um, we talked about this a week or so ago. I sent him an email with the uh, meeting contact information. 
but he does not appear to be in evidence. So let's move on to the um, the budget discussion. All right, we'll move on then to 7A, uh, which is a budget review and discussion. This is a first look at our uh, budget for next year. We'll take comment, we'll adjust, we'll make changes as the board gives directive or as you question, and then we'll bring it to a vote at our next meeting. Uh, Mike, can you put that up on our screen? And here it is. <clears throat> the, um, this is shown in comparison to the current uh, 2020 year to date uh, expenses and costs. Uh, that's through the end of September. So that's nine months out of the year. And we're through 144,000 and change so far this year. Um, the, the new budget is at $250,000. The indications are the green areas are those that have increased or are for projected to increase. And the red numbers are some of the decreases. So I'm forecasting that we'll have somewhat less legal expenses this year, but um, some increase in telephone, internet, minor, minor um, office rent uh, going up as uh, the rent here on this building has gone up and there is uh, going to be a some exchange of space in the office to where we'll have a little more space than we have now. So we'll be paying approximately half of the rent where we were playing, paying about <clears throat> two fifths of the rent before. Otherwise, most of the rest of it is about the same. I had originally forecast less money for event fund and event support um, because at least two of the events from last year have carried over to this year or at least are projecting to have their events this year. And so there won't be additional event fund money other than what was committed last year, but it will get expent out of this budget. But um, Darren had suggested we keep the full amount uh, in case we have uh, a recovery and we have people that are looking to do events at the uh, facilities and uh, we'll have the money allocated to be able to support that. John and Phil, I, we haven't been through an event fund with you on the board yet, correct? Uh, so what we use this money for is to encourage uh, events to happen at the public facilities that we have helped to develop. And so uh, the idea there is that we would help, especially with marketing, uh, that would bring in people from outside of Kitsap uh, to these events who would then stay in hotels, uh, eat out, uh, you know, uh, spend money in Kitsap. And so, um, the event fund maybe wouldn't be used this next year. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, but it's uh, even with twenty-five thousand. I wouldn't mind if it were fifty thousand um, to encourage more events to happen. And we only do it for two or three years. We don't do it every year for the same ones. But to help events get started, that then draw more people to our facilities. So. That's the idea behind it. And I think it's a, a really good way of us spending our money um, where we get um, a lot of return for our investment that way. Sounds pretty familiar to say the city of Bremerton's LTAC fund. I'm not familiar with that. Maybe Mike, you are. What's that? 
uh, a city's lodging tax allocation, LTAC. Uh, I assume it's similar. Is the process similar? There's multiple criteria that have to be made. Yeah, we publish the information on the website and distribute it. And uh, it's not quite like the lodging tax, uh, but it's similar in a sense that we have criteria that they need to meet uh, in order to qualify. And uh, as Darren said, we provide the marketing support to get more reach so that they get more attendees. But we've done a variety of different things all the way from um, wrestling tournaments to um, events at the fairgrounds for antiques um, that drew thousands uh, and so on. So it's been a variety of things. Some are more successful than others and some don't work out as well. Are there any questions uh, for, the, for the budget or any comment or uh, guidance you'd like to give? What, what, what's the process from here, Darren? Uh, so we'll do this discussion tonight. Um, we would make any revisions off of that discussion. Uh, we'd let it sit for a month uh, until our December meeting, and then we would vote for our budget in December. Correct. So if we had input on uh, the budget now or next month would be an appropriate spot for that. If, if you've got input now, that's fine. I'll make note of that and, and make some adjustments uh, as the board approves or suggests. And then we can discuss it further on the final version in December. Yeah, I would say if, uh, John, if you look through it, um, process wise and you see something, you know, put an email out to everybody um, with that suggestion um, so that, um, you know, we have that idea going into the meeting so that more, most likely we just approve it at the next meeting rather than have any substantive discussion. Okay. I would, is, is it possible, Mike, for you to put this budget, um, the column you've got against now, I can't see the title of it right now, but I believe it's only a year to date for this year. Yeah. So could we see the proposed annual 2021 budget against the approved 2020, the total year? Oh, the total? Well, okay. I'm, I'm 250 versus 180, but that's not, I, can't, I don't want to do the math and extrapolate out. So yeah. If you, yes, if you just, I can. Okay, just email it out to us so we're comparing apples apples. That'd be great. Thank you, Aaron. Anybody else? All right. Um, let's move on to 7B then, okay. uh, the 2021 meeting schedule discussion. Let me back up one item if I can because I have the – Activity report. <clears throat> um, not much happening right now with regional projects. Um, the new projects that uh, you've heard the status reports for those. The Brian is working on a contract for the new construction consultant. I've had a couple of conversations with Shannon so far, and we need to virtually sit down and talk about the, the final details and the costs. He did have a, uh, a cost estimate in his proposal, um, but we'll work out those details and we'll, we may have the, the contract available in October for review and approval. Uh, other organizations I've been discussing with VKP about the uh, action plan for 2021 and uh, we'll have uh, her agreement or Brian will prepare the agreement and we'll have her action plan for 2021 
also at the December meeting. Uh, I obviously didn't do a good job of arranging for an update at the October meeting because our financial advisor wasn't here. So I'll check with him and find out what happened there. Um, I've been working on digital signatures, particularly with uh, the new uh, directors on the board. I have their signatures and those have been submitted. Um, and Brian is uh, preparing new additions or have just passed the bylaws for the changes to solidify that um, digital signature process. So we're still working on doing board meetings. I think they're getting better. You can tell me. Um, we're in the process of upgrading network sec security. I have a new firewall uh, on the computer. The PC upgrade is going forward, although we went a, a, did have a glitch with the uh, consultant that we hired to work with us. It didn't work out. So um, I went through the purchase process myself for what we'll use into the future. Um, I have been working with Susan to work on uh, accounting setup for new projects, and you saw that reflected in our financial reports tonight. Um, this is a point of interest. I have gotten a couple of conflict of interest forms. We do have to fill these out every year, and that typically is in the June, July time frame, so we're a little behind the curve. Uh, if you would look for those, if you don't see them in the emails I've sent out, I'll be glad to send out a new contract conflict of interest form to those that haven't completed them yet. Um, uh, Mike, this is Walt. <clears throat> yep. If we don't know if we've completed them yet or not, can you email us if we're delinquent? Yep. I will be happy to do that. It's on my to-do list. Um, I made a note here about uh, Visit Kitsap is asking for a rearrangement of office spaces to give us some more space. Of course, then we'll pay a little more uh, rent for that. Um, one thing you didn't see was the new spreadsheet and Gantt chart to try and depict the uh, the funding requirements, although I did send those out to all of the directors. Um, you saw some changes in the timelines that were orig originally proposed. So you'll see that reflected in the next uh, Gantt chart and, and spreadsheet that I send out. So we have uh, business in regard to Circuit of the Northwest that we'll talk about in our um, in our executive session. Any other questions? Sorry, I was talking while muted. I apologize. Uh, I was saying thank you, Mike, for that. And we still have our 7B 2021 meeting scheduled discussion to yes. talk about. And this is the proposed uh, meeting schedule. It comes in the form of a resolution Resolution 2 in 2020. And this is proposed at this point as it was this year. Um, a meeting a year basically on the fourth Monday of the month, uh, except where there has been some conflicts um, with the BOCC meeting if we do it in uh, county administration building. 
in May, you'll notice here, this is on the last day of the month. Uh, our typical meeting would be May 24th. If we're having it as a Zoom meeting, we can have it on May 24th. If we don't, if we have it in, uh, in the county administration building quarters, we'll do it in the, in the 31st. Um, and again, the December meeting is the combined November and December meeting to avoid uh, absences during the holidays in November and December. Any questions about the proposed schedule? And again, this is a discussion and consideration. We'll actually vote on this in December. Unless everybody's happy with this, you could approve it now, but it's typically designed to be suggested and then uh, ratified in at the December meeting. Um, on the December 6th meeting, it's the only one on there that's not mentioned that it's or Zoom, do you think? Just to be careful, we should add that. Yeah, I, I can certainly add that. Yeah. Uh, John and Phil and other uh, uh, members or attendees who are listening, uh, it was our practice that we would meet at um, uh, the hotel. Is it the Best Western? Is that what it is right Correct. now? Or yeah. Um, in Silverdale and had a regular meeting in a regular room. Um, but as we were going through the different uh, proposals uh, that we received for funding from the different areas, uh, came to an understanding that uh, people are much more likely to come and speak to us if we're in their town. And so we tend to get a lot more people from Port Orchard when we're actually meeting in Port Orchard. We get a lot more people from Bainbridge Island when we're meeting in Bainbridge Island. And so as a way of being able to both have the public know uh, what we do and to promote that, but also to be able to get more input uh, from the community, uh, we made this kind of revolving uh, meeting schedule to try and accomplish that. So I'm attempting to have some semblance of normal. <laughs> we'll see where it goes. Okay, any other questions or discussion? All right, we'll uh, table this then until our next meeting. Um, and then does that cover everything from one to seven, Mike? Yeah, let's, uh, let me take one quick look here, it does. Um, Good. It, that is correct. Okay, so at this point in time, uh, we, the board will be going into executive session and we are doing that for the purpose of discussing uh, potential or threatened litigation and that's authorized by RCW 42.30.110, uh, uh, parentheses one, parentheses I. Um, we are expecting that this will take uh, 30 minutes. And so uh, we will be going, the way that this will transpire is we will go into a separate Zoom chat um, and it is now 7.39. So we will uh, plan to return at 8.10. If we do not, if we're not able to return at 8.10, I will uh, come back and notify everybody of a new time set. But at this point, we will be going into executive session um, and we will return at 810. Can I ask a technical question? So we leave this meeting and then log in with uh, uh, the meeting number and the password for the executive session. And then when that's over, we leave that one and log back in to this one. Is that what we do? Correct. Okay. All right.
Yep. Uh, I'd like to uh, call the meeting uh, that had started on Monday, August 26th uh, back to order. Um, it is now uh, October 28th, Wednesday. It's 8 p.m. And um, uh, we want to apologize to all of you who were attending that meeting uh, for the disruption uh, to um, your schedules. Uh, we had a technical technological uh, mishap where our Zoom meeting stopped um, and there was no way to restart it uh, with all of you. And so this seemed the best course of action uh, as we spoke about it to contact each of you individually who were on there as well as to put it on our website to say that we would be uh, having this meeting to best do the Open Public Meetings uh, Act. So uh, with that, um, we rejoin our previous meeting at item number nine, which is ongoing discussion. If Mike, you wanna put that up. And it's to discuss uh, the Port of Bremerton uh, Circuit of the Northwest project. This is a discussion uh, that had been uh, delayed uh, for uh, the purpose of making sure that all seven of our members could be here uh, for this discussion. And we have a full board now and uh, we can um, have this discussion together. So with that, um, I just open it to the board if, if anybody would uh, like to start us. Aaron, you're muted. That's okay, I also changed screens while I was at it. Um, yeah, we wanted to bring this up to discuss um, uh, the looking at funding on additional or the final set of drawings, I believe. Now I don't have my items in front of me. Um, we did realize that, uh, that there's some items that need to be completed based on the ILA that we had awarded funds on previously. Um, I believe that information is getting out to, if not already gotten out to the Port of Bremerton on this. So at this point, um, my understanding is we'll be waiting to get the completion on those and be able to proceed in discussing this further. Anybody got comments? Any other comments? I would, I would just uh, second what Aaron said, you know, I, I I think, um, I, as I've said previously, I, I, I do support, you know, at least looking at the uh, final design uh, uh, as potentially getting uh, some funds uh, down the road, but given what the requirements were previously from the prior ILA, I think uh, those need to be met and then they can maybe do another ask for it. Uh, Darren, I, I, I would note that since the July meeting, uh, we've gained uh, half a million dollars in discretionary funding due to being released from our obligation to the county for uh, uh, turfing the field at uh, Loby Field. So we're in a, a little bit better uh, financial uh, position. I wonder if in addition to working on with the uh, Port of Bremerton on uh, wrapping up the several items from our existing ILA that have yet to be finalized, uh, uh, there was some discussion at some point about the Port of Bremerton uh, front funding uh, this project and then we would repay the Port of Bremerton uh, over some agreed upon period of time. Anybody else remember that? <clears throat> yes, that comment was made at the July meeting. So it seems like we got a couple of, of things to work on with the Port of Bremerton, if the Port of Bremerton, you know, is willing to proceed down there to see if we can work out uh, some arrangements and then we would service that uh, that debt uh, over time by uh, uh, repaying the Port of Bremerton. And I'm not sure what their capability is to, to fund, fund it up front. Any other comment or discussion? This isn't as much about this, but with the 500,000 that came back from the county, 
when I read that letter, did they kind of hint that they had something else planned that they might want to see done with that money? No, not that I'm aware of. I thought they mentioned some other something else that they'd like to discuss later with us. I'm going to have to go back and look. Yeah. I don't remember that. <clears throat> Highlighted on the screen that I'm sharing is something that uh, Brian pointed out to me, which was uh, Clause 6 in the ILA with the port that was conditions and contingencies for the port and us to accomplish if there was any further participation beyond phase two. So that's highlighted there. So those are the items that we've noted need to be completed. Yes. If, if there's going to be a discussion to, of anything beyond phase two, this is what needs to be completed. Okay. Mike, I, I have a question on item 6D, the uh, review by the Department of Commerce. W when we've dealt with them, and you, you've dealt with them on our uh, other three projects that we're working on, didn't we kind of get a wave off from them? Uh, not that it wouldn't be required, but that it wouldn't be required right now? Correct. Uh, I talked with the Department of Commerce first about the CNW port project, and <clears throat> I got a report back from them that said, uh, at the point that you're going to A, sell bonds, or B, start construction, uh, then we'll um, take a look at it when we went back and talked about the three projects that are under ILA that we've made some financial commitments to, I went through the same process with them. They studied it, looked at it, originally said that they would do a staged three-part feasibility review, but that was before COVID started. And, um, Two or three months into that, they came back and said, at this point, we don't anticipate doing any feasibility reviews for your projects at this time. So I think we need to be farther down the road to either selling bonds or committing a project to construction before we get involved with, with the Department of Commerce. So, so do Brian, what does that mean, you know, if, if we uh, further investigate a possible arrangement with the Port of Riverton regarding the circuit of the Northwest, would, would 6D not be required? Uh, correct. If we can document what Mike just said through emails or letters. Yeah, that, I have email. Uh, they've, let me finish, Mike, please. Uh, if we can right. document it by letters or emails that they've done this preliminary analysis as to this project, um, then I think we can document our file that uh, 6D did not need to be completed at this time. Okay, so Mike, you can forward that information over to Brian for review. Sure. Great. Any of the other ones outside of Port of Bremerton to do? Or the DOC of no this A through G on this on this list on number six. What are the provisions of? Uh, I'm looking at item six F, the provisions of the RCW. I, I, I don't know what that means. Uh, that's a reference to a section in the Interlocal Agreement Act that uh, requires uh, within, within the interlocal agreement, um, one, two, three, four, five, five, five things that, that normally we put into an ILA. So you have to have a statement of a duration. Um, if, if the two public agencies are creating a third agency to administer a program, you have to identify, you know, who that third agency is, which I don't, think comes into play with us. 
Um, you have to state in the ILA its purpose or purposes, which we always do. Um, in the ILA, you have to state the manner of financing the joint or cooperative undertaking um, and maintaining a budget for that. So we would put in that type of provision, which we normally do. Um, and you have to have a provision in the ILA that says um, what, what, how, how do you uh, terminate the agreement? And we do that in uh, our ILAs and, uh, and how you dispose of any property uh, upon termination. So if, you know, if, for example, two agencies get together and they buy a piece of land to do a joint project and then the project falls apart, you need to address in advance how you're going to dispose of that land. But again, that um, wouldn't be particularly relevant here where the port owns the land and the PFD funding really goes to improving the land. So that's, that's the, the guts of the statutory reference there. Thank you. Any other discussion? Uh, Darren, there was an attendee uh, with the hand up. I see that. Thank oh. you, Tom. I just wanted to make sure that the board was able to have the discussion uh, first. I'd be curious I, to see I, it might be relevant to the discussion. Okay. I, I do plan to call okay. on uh, Mr. Rothlin. Anything else? So I think there was a motion tabled from July. Is there anything that we have to do with further action on said motion? I don't think we can, right? You know, uh, until we get verification that phase six is better, these requirements are made, then, you know, I don't think we could make a motion until we get verification. But once they are, then I, I would say that a motion would be appropriate at that time, one way or the other. Did we have a motion in July? We that was did. Yours. That was yours. Was there. I didn't make a note of it in the minutes. I think there was the consideration for one, uh, but the tabling um, took that action off the table. I don't think you actually ever moved. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, somebody share with me what the details. I was not present at that meeting. Mike, do you want to provide those, or you have um, in in the July meeting? Um, Axel Strackle John from the port was uh, no. This was after that um, presentation had been made by the people at CNW and the port. In the following meeting, um, Brian or Aaron brought that up and began uh, consideration of a motion. There was some discussion um, around that there were not all of the members present. Uh, we were missing a Bainbridge Island representative. <clears throat> and um, Aaron agreed at that time not to put the, uh, the motion forward. And then we went on to another item on the agenda. Yeah, I, I think someone's telling me via text that I might have had the motion tabled. So, and I hate to tell you that I don't recall how we did it, but even if, it, if it's been tabled, then it still sits tabled while we wait for these items to be completed, correct? We, we have the meeting recorded on video, so it will yeah, be easy we'll for us it. to go back and look exactly what happened. Okay. Um, let's recognize uh, Mr. Rothlin at this time. Mike, can you bring okay. him in? You would like to make yeah. a comment, and I'd like to recognize okay. that. Hang on one second, and I will bring uh, both in if they're there. Or well, Mike's doing that. Let me add to the last discussion. I went back and found the July minutes. Uh, there's a discussion about the Port of Bremerton project, and um, the very last sentence says the motion was not put forward. So there, <laughs> there was no motion made Thank uh, you, in July.
Do we have them in yet? I don't see them. I don't see oh, them. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. Axel, you're still there. You go. Hello. <laughs> oh. We hear you. <clears throat> you may want to put your uh, video on. Thanks. Yeah, my Wi-Fi is kind of weak out here. So I'm sorry. My Wi-Fi just crashed. Um, so uh, Axel Streckle, John Commissioner with the port, um, not Axel Rothland. <laughs> <laughs> I wondered if you'd uh, – oh, no, never mind. Would you like to make a comment? Uh, I think he's Jim, we, we've lost Axel, Jim. Yeah. Can you see me? I, I look, I'm looking like I'm we blank. Cannot, but, we okay. cannot see you. No, I've got a black screen. That's interesting. Okay. Um, well, I, I uh, not sure what Axel had comments on. I um, I don't have any specific comments. I'm this is all new to me as I'm hearing this. So I guess I'm trying to understand. Um, so these items that you had listed are items that were not completed from the original ILA. Is that kind of what I'm hearing? Okay. Okay. I I wasn't clear if that was a new thing or old. So I I don't have the ILA in front of me or anything. I. Um, so I don't, there's, as I'm looking at it, I'm not privy to what the RCWs that, that are specific to that um, document, but um, if this is pretty standard things, I don't really see any issues with anything that's there. So if, for, if, just so that I'm clear, you just need responses to these A through G items and then the ILA is complete. So then you can move forward about talking about additional funding. Is that kind of what I'm hearing? Just so I got it clear. Okay. I mean, I don't, I don't see any any issues with that. I think it's all pretty standard. Well, well, Jim, except that 6A is the mutual adoption of a funding protocol. So I think the port and the PFD probably need to agree on that in order to satisfy this requirement. Yeah, I'm not even sure what that means, to be honest with you, Walt. Well, um, nor, nor am I. <laughs> I'm sure the attorneys who put it together can clarify it for us. Because if it, this is this is an ILA that's already been completed, if I'm understanding. So um, I'm not sure what a funding protocol would mean. My turn. Right. The, there's that. Yeah. Mike, were you trying to say something? You're, Mike, you're still on mute. In the meantime, Brian, I know you were party to drafting this, correct? Can you give us a little background as to what A is actually outlining? Uh, I'll, I'll do my best without going back to, to my notes from, from 2018. Um, the idea was with, with that ILA in 2018 was not to do a full uh, ILA that we normally do with a lot of components about um, what do you have to do to get the money? When you get the money, what's the funding process? Um, do we have any oversight? What, whatever. Um, so I, I think the the notion of A was simply before money was given out again, we would have to go back and, and adopt something more substantial as to um, what the money's for, how it's, again, paid out, um, how it's verified, how it's accounted for. And, and um, we've 
essentially done that in the other ILAs. You know, we've required separate accounting, separate accounts, separate accounting. Um, um, I think we pay when um, the other entities spend money. You know, so if they said they're going to do a feasibility analysis and they're going to hire someone, it's like, okay, you consult with us on who you've hired. You hire them. They do the work. You pay them. We pay you back sort of thing. So I think that's, that's the basic mechanism of the, of the funding protocol. So oh, Brian, that would be for the, the upcoming ILA, not for the one that we've already completed. Is that correct? It, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, so I guess I'm trying to understand what's being asked. Um, are we trying to complete the old ILA so we can move forward on um, whether or not another one is even needed? Um, or what are we trying to accomplish here? What, so you guys can do what you're trying to do. So, so my take is that the, the 2018 ILA was for something called phase two funding. Uh, it, was, it was kind of a truncated, uh, single limited purpose ILA, and that's done. Okay. But paragraph six said, if the port comes back for further funding requests, we're not gonna do it the same way we just did it here on a truncated basis. We're gonna adopt something that's, that's more formal, more substantial, has, has more, you know, meat on the bones than, okay. than what we did in 2018. And again, it's, 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 um, it's something that w we do on our side with our ILA partners. Yeah. And, and we've done it with, uh, you know, the three projects that were selected yeah. to receive funds. So, so okay. in, a, in a sense, it's probably, um, and, and with those three other projects, we basically told them, we don't want to have different deals with each of you. We want to standardize our deals, our protocols as much as possible. So, and, and so they're pretty uniform. There's a tweak here, a tweak there for some special circumstance. So I think really on your side, your team probably needs to look at, you know, the, the Palsbo ILA, the County ILA, the Port Orchard ILA, one, one or all of them and, and see, Oh, this is, this is what the KPFD wants from us. If, yeah we want money from them. Okay, that makes sense. Um, but I guess the part, so you're saying, because isn't, wasn't the, the funding approved before the ILA is actually being um, put together? Or you're saying the ILA is put together before we even know if funding is approved? That seems like that's backwards. Yeah, it's, it's usually the protocol is, um, there's an agreement in principle to funding and it's subject to negotiating an ILA. Yeah. Okay. But I, I, I think what your attorney Frank and I were thinking back in November, you know, two years ago when we were putting this thing together, it was, on, it was kind of on an expedited basis. There was some reason why there was a, you know, a kind of a big push to get, get it done quickly. Um, I think we were thinking we, we, in this document, we really should try to be thinking ahead as to what are the next steps going to be when when the port comes back for more money, and so let's put it in here now and and kind of spell out um, what the relationship will be for the next round of funding. Right, but doesn't that make sense to do like you did with the other projects to approve the funding so that we could? It doesn't really make sense to me to to make an agreement when I don't even know if there's an agreement to be made. So. I guess we're kind of waiting to hear from the commission whether or not this funding is something they want to move forward on. And what I'm suggesting is, is like for a, the funding protocol, I'd say, go, go look at what's in the other ILAs and come back and say, Oh yeah, we can do that. Okay. Then we know that um, we're not going to have an issue negotiating the ILA with you. We'll, we'll already have, an agreement in concept. So when we sit down to do the actual ILA, we're not starting from scratch. We're starting from a point of common agreement that here's how we're going to do the funding protocol. It, it just seems back. I mean, is that what you did? Because what I'm hearing is with the other projects, you went the other way. You approved the funding first, and then you put the ILA. It just doesn't make sense to come up with an agreement when we're not even clear as whether there's something to be agreed upon. I mean, I'm looking at those documents, and I, that's pretty standard. I don't see any issues with putting something like that together. Um, wouldn't, wouldn't the, the 
correct process be to first approve the funding and then put the ILA together? That's, Jim, what, we my, do. That's what we do. I think we're talking across purposes. Even, even the 2018 ILA, the board, I, I think the board, no, no, you guys didn't approve the funding until all. You approved the funding before the ILA was signed, but, but it was kind of an iterative process. Um, the, the board wanted to see an ILA before they made the final approval. So if, if I had to describe it in layman's term, I think what happened in the fall of 2018 is the board said, well, we like this project. We'd like to put some money into it, but you know, we need, we need an agreement and, and so on. So our board was willing to go forward tentatively to fund, yeah. um, but they wanted an agreement in place. And yeah. I think the port was the same way. Um, and, and Jim, just to speak to it as well, I believe all three uh, ILAs that we've signed with uh, Port Orchard, with uh, Palsbo, with Kitsap County, all have gone in the same format of finishing the ILA and then approval of funding. Thanks, Darren. So, hey, Michael, Mike, will you put the um, six items, uh, number six, back up or number six, whatever it was? I'd like to give Axel an opportunity to speak. He had his hand up first and uh, got knocked off the line. But, Axel, what did you want to say? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I apologize. I think our Wi Fi is uh, a bit stretched here this evening. Um, so, just a bit of back the bus up a little bit. Um, for review purposes. So, you know, we, our request was for 1.4 million for infrastructure to access the public, public area um, in which you want to transition the current use from the airport side over transition to across the highway side. So with that, um, the, the commission has supported uh, fronting the $1.4 million with a payback over time through tax revenues through the to the, uh, to the PFP. So that's kind of, I know there's some question back and forth between Aaron and, and some of you as to what the history was. And uh, yes, it was tabled back in July. That is, that is a correct statement. Um, as far as the ILA goes, uh, we have our attorney here this evening. She has uh, had her hand up for quite a while. And uh, she, uh, if you'd like to call on her for any clarification, but um, we have no problem following through and moving forward with an, an agreed ILA and of course striking item, probably D and F or are probably easy, easy, easy line outs for us. So uh, that's pretty much all I have. And thank you. Uh, all right. Uh, could we add Ryan? Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ann Montgomery. I'm general counsel for the Port of Bremerton. Um, and I raised my hand initially when Axel got kicked off the um, the meeting here, but in looking at the items that the 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 district is is looking to be completed before they go ahead with this, I wanted to mention that the the documentation that was provided uh, by the port and by circuits in the Northwest back in July answers most, if not all, of these questions. Uh, I think Axel just answered the first one, and if we take out item D, uh, the information has been provided. If you need to have it again, we can certainly provide that, but I, I think these these items can all be checked off, and uh, the, the port is essentially ready to move forward. All right, so uh, in summary, uh, we will... Uh, have all of those items uh, finished off by the port and then continue uh, the discussion at that point. Am I correct in understanding the will of the board and the back and forth between uh, the Port of Bremerton and, um, and our council as well? So let me make sure from what... Um Ms. Montgomery just said. So you're you're feeling that the information's there, it's just not maybe complete in one place, but everything's done. Anne? 
Right. From what from what I from what I see of what was put up on the shared screen, uh, that information's already been provided, and we'd be happy to provide it again. Uh, but most of that information was in the packet that was provided back in July. Okay. So, what is our expectation from the port? Then we know that the we've we've got to make sure we've got the Commerce Department part covered. Are, are we asking for a recap to? To take out all the other line items to show they've been completed. So ILA two is done. I'm asking the rest of the board here. Yeah, I I would say if, if Anne, if you don't mind, maybe uh, just submitting uh, that summary of things to Brian, so Brian can verify that everything's met, and maybe at the next meeting he can confirm that, and then you know whatever motion wants to be made upon uh, on that. Um, would be the proper way to go. Thank you, Phil. We we will be happy to do that. All right. So, and, and then let, let me make sure I understood from what um, Axel just said that for this million, uh, million four, it's a little shy of a million five that we're discussing here. Did I understand that that could be something that the Port of Bremerton does put up front and then is paid back over time by the public facilities? Yes. And we lose him. Yes. If, if that, yes, I can tell you that the commissioners have talked about it in, in public meetings already and stated that if that was something that would um, be uh, where PA would help PFD move this forward, yes, they'd be willing to do that. Okay. So, and that's great. That's really good news. Um, is it appropriate then for me to at least put a motion out there that we have this? Uh, this that idea put together and uh, moved on at the next meeting. I don't uh, think I, that would I, ask for a motion or require a motion. I think we've already given a directive to uh, or in agreement with support that they would uh, put forward the answers to those uh, specific uh, pieces of the ILA, and Brian will review. And we'll be informed of that and then um, take action. I, I think we, before we're ready to vote on a thumbs up or thumbs down on some potential uh, agreement, one, we need to confirm the amount. I've heard 1.4, I've seen 1.499. So, how much are we actually talking about? And then, importantly for us, um, uh, how would the payback work? Over what period of time? Would there be an interest rate uh, involved? So, we, you know, we need to run that against our cash flow projection mm -hmm. and make sure that we're not creating a problem for ourselves. And I think we need that information before the directors can, or the, the uh, members, board members can vote, vote yes or no. So is that something that the Port of Bremerton, if they're going to be fronting this money, would be asking us at a, I mean, setting up the parameters on the interest rate or however? Well, I think we knew what the port's expectations are. Is it going to be paid back over five years, 10 years? Uh, is, there an, is there an interest rate associated with it? Uh, so we know what we're buying into. Okay. I think for me to be able to move on that or, or have further discussion as well, as I wasn't part of that board um, uh, when those decisions were made, uh, is also to understand this board's intentions with the other three projects. Uh, as I read the current ILAs, they don't take to full capacity um, of what we potentially could fund via the bonding and some of the forecasts I've seen. Um, but I, I would need some further discussion amongst us on what our intentions are there so I could know what money is available to, uh, to the port. Okay. And just to note, we, you know, we can be flexible there. I think ideally what the port is um, looking to do is um, when we put this money up, we will probably bond the majority of it, but to set the bond payments um, equal to what would work for the PFD as far as repayment. So if it's a 
five-year payback, we would set up bonding there. If it needed to be a 10-year, we could set up a bond there. So we have flexibility depending on what you guys are looking to do. Uh, and John, in response to that too, that was our intention with uh, item number um, oh, uh, number 5D uh, from our update from our financial advisor was to at least give you the understanding of what um, what kind of funding does the does the PFD uh, believe that we have available to us. And then uh, the reason to look at those other projects was to give you that understanding of uh, what would that total commitment be and what is our intention with those other projects so that we can answer, uh, is there money available uh, for this as a consideration? And I think my uh, last question of the port, and I don't know if this is the appropriate place for that or, or later would be uh, if, if we're finishing I believe this ask was for design and construction uh, planning fee. Uh, how does the port uh, plan on ensuring the uh, public portion funding uh, for the for the project as well? Is is that tied into this ILA also? Wasn't that item? That's, that's a condition of the ILA as well. Okay. All right. Um, well, I think. Uh, We've talked over the pieces that we can talk over. And so at this point, I'm going to adjourn the meeting. Thank I, you, I everybody. Just, can I have yes. one last question? Mike, were sure, you able sure, to, sure. Mike, Mike Walton, were you able to talk to, um, I think it's Alan. I know he, he didn't make the, the earlier meeting. Will he be on the next one? Yes, he will. I talked to Alan, and um, that was on me. I had put that on the agenda originally, but I had forgotten that I had spoken to Alan and, uh, and he was going to compile some more information and have some more detail available on December. Um, when Darren had talked to me about making sure that all of the board members were going to be there, he had also said about uh, having Alan there and I didn't close the loop. So Alan was not on call for that meeting and I'll take the blame for that. Uh, but he will be available in December. Okay, and, and just make sure we all get the info beforehand so we've had time to look at it. So. Yeah, will do. Uh, he said he would probably have the preliminary stuff in about two weeks. All right, thank you everybody. Our meeting is adjourned. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you guys. Thank, thank you, you all. <laughs>